Good morning, Wine Press. I pray you woke up feeling blessed and that you felt the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit with you because He is. Amen. He is with you. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And even in times where it seems like it's difficult and you on your own, you are never alone. Amen. I don't know, just before church we were singing this song, I think we'll sing it again. Amen. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. I'm so glad my Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus set me free. Oh, I'm so glad Jesus set me free. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. I'm so glad my Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus set me free. Oh, Satan had me bound. But Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound. But Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound. But Jesus set me free. <coughs> Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus set me free. So I'm so glad. Jesus set me free. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus set me free. Amen. Say glory, hallelujah. Our Jesus has set us free. I'm so grateful for the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm glad that when the enemy had me bound to drug addiction and sin and depression, that Jesus set me free. Amen. That he turned my life around and that we are singing the glory, <coughs> excuse us, of our Lord in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Just hug someone next to you real quick. <laughs> If you're all by yourself, hug yourself. Amen. Say the Lord is loving on you this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're so grateful for his presence. You know, the last number of weeks, uh, Willie and Andrea have been doing Thursday nights. And, and the scripture that we've been going over again and again, Psalms 37, verse 3, to, to literally trust in the Lord and to do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. And that just seems like all through the week, so the last few weeks, this scripture, well, this is one of my favorite scriptures, Psalm 37. You, you know that. I, re I repeat this psalm again and again, never tire of it. There's so much in this particular psalm that is so sustaining for our life. But this particular verse is one that I've, I've, I've depended on over the years that trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord. Don't resort to the world's behavior. Don't resort to, to the way other people are, are acting. Do good. Be righteous. Be upright in all that we're doing. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. And, of course, we talked about this last week and, and how we can commit our way to the Lord. Trust in him. And he will bring everything that concerns us to pass. It doesn't say in that particular verse what it is. Of course, it's talking about when evil men seem to be prospering in their way, when they seem to they devise plans and they seem to be succeeding in their way. Have you ever just had somebody out for you at work? Have you ever just had somebody that was just, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, they said, I had a job one time, and uh, I, I worked for a mortgage company. It was a mortgage company and a law office, and I forget what else. Anyway, there was like 13 lines, and uh, uh, all of them had to be answered in a different way. Good morning, and you had to, you know, some of it was mortgage company. Some of it was the name of the mortgage company. Some of it was law office or the name of the attorney, and each one had a very specific thing. And, and uh, the, you know, I got hired by by the person but his mother was the office manager and he didn't want, she didn't want him to hire me she wanted me him to hire his brother and uh, and so I just from the day I walked in I was in trouble 
you know, because it didn't matter what. It had nothing to do with Pauline. In, in the long run, it really had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with I just wasn't the one that she wanted hired, you know. But from the day I walked in, and, and so I, just, just, a, just a quick, uh, a brief, a brief uh, uh, incident was every day I would write down the 13 ways that I had to answer the phone so when one of the lines rang, I could look at it and answer it the appropriate way. And every day I went to lunch, that list disappeared. And then I'd have to write it out again, and then every day at lunch, the list would disappear. And it just seemed like again and again and again, just being sabotaged. And, you know, when you see things like that happen, it can be very frustrating, you know, and it can be distressing. And then it always made me look like I couldn't manage my job, that I was incompetent. And it just, it was a day after day. One day, I, I was at this job for months, and, and one day, uh, one of the other employees came over and says, you know, if you left for lunch and never came back, nobody in this office would blame you, <laughs> you know, because they could see the persecution that was happening again, and they felt sorry for me and said, why are you putting up with it? Because the Lord said, endure hardship, all right? So when you're faced with persecution, when you're faced with situations that are going on around God, don't resort to the tactics of the world, you know, but continually be like Jesus. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, respond with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, patience, joy, kindness, meekness, gentleness, long-suffering, all right? And so, so all of these things, let it come out. This is the test of the genuineness of the faith that is in us. The genuineness of the faith. That's what First Peter that we've been in for months now has been all about. He's been teaching persecuted Christians when you are abused, when you're persecuted, when, when you are ill-treated. Do not respond in kind, but respond with the fruit of the Spirit. Respond in the ways of the Lord. That through your goodness, your kindness, through your actions, they will come to know the genuineness of your faith. And so I think it's so important because I'm telling you, church, I mean, you can't you can look around in the United States of America. We, we've enjoyed uh, so much religious freedom. And, and so you can look around and you can begin to see that tightening, tightening, tightening. You can see the, the attitude changing. You can see all kinds of things that are going on and know that, that there's going to come a time where we really know what it's like to be persecuted for our faith. I mean, some people have been persecuted on small numbers, but overall, globally, you can see them setting up words that are coming out of politicians' mouth, words that are coming off the news, words that are coming across in, in articles and blogs. You can see that there's a real, those Christians, those Christians. And so it's important more than ever that we know what does it mean to be like Jesus, to be imitators of Christ, where he was persecuted, how did he respond in the face of persecution? How did he respond when he was treated illy? He did not get angry and upset and demand his rights. He just simply, he was so profound. I mean, it's time and time again, they would try to catch him. They'd try to set him up, and he knew. He just knew, and he would just answer in a way that they were left dumbfounded. It's like, you know, how are we going to respond to that? And he had such, he had such, you know, the Holy Spirit will give you that same wisdom. He said in James that if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who will give it to, give it to you liberally and will not withhold it. But to pray and ask, not double-minded, you know, because a double-minded man is unstable in all, all of his ways. But do you realize that you have access to the same wisdom that Jesus Christ had? You have access. We have free access. We are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We have the same access that Jesus had. And so you and I, filled with his spirit, have the same access to the wisdom, the understanding, the discernment to know how we are to walk. And so, so it says trust in the Lord. And do good. Now, let's just stop for a moment. Something just hit me like a ton of bricks. You know, trust in the Lord and do good. In other words, we resort to the world's way when we don't trust God. Just hit me when I looked at that scripture right now. Trust in the Lord and do good. And when we don't trust him, Lita would say this again and again so often. He said, you know, when he says everything that sin, every sin that starts out with doubt unbelief it begins with unbelief 
So to trust in the Lord means to believe. But if we have unbelief, if we have doubt, it's going to be exposed by pressure. You know, our weaknesses are exposed by pressure. And right now there's a lot of pressure. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in really enjoying, I, I think T.D. Jakes is one of the most profound preachers. A uh, profound amount of wisdom and understanding and discernment. And especially in this last two years, I would really watch him a lot on, on uh, YouTube uh, during, the last, during the whole COVID season. Just kind of curious how he was navigating some of the circumstances that was going around. And he shows so much wisdom. And, and he, he wrote a book in 2018, 2019 called Crushing. And I would recommend everybody to read that book. But I think that God gave him that book just like he gave John Bevere the revision of, of um, Undercover. I believe he gave him that book for such a time as this. And, and so he's also doing on TV and on YouTube, you can watch uh, Crushing, on whole, the whole series of the book. If you're not a reader, you can watch the videos and, and begin to understand that what God is doing is he is preparing, he is preparing the body for the pouring out, you know, I mean, everybody wants revival right here like this, but you don't understand that there's a time of preparation. And Lena, he's talking about the wine. He's talking about the wine. And the dream that God gave you guys years ago, I believe that we are right now coming into the fullness of, of that dream about this last day wine. And Becky, I thought about you uh, as I was watching a video by him today because he says, fruit won't last. He says the only way fruit, he says the grape is literally raised up to be crushed because the value is in what's poured forth through the crushing and the wine. The only way it can remain is wine. You said that some time back when we were talking about that. We were talking about, so God is making wine. He is literally, you know, we can't, we can't give what we don't have. And God right now is taking the fruit and fruitfulness, he says, you know, you can have one of the greatest seasons of fruitfulness in your life and suddenly God just cuts it back and he prunes it. Why? For better growth. You see, God doesn't just look at the fruitfulness that we have. It can be awesome fruitfulness. But then he says, you know what? I know you can bear more. I know you can do more. I know that you can be more fruitful than where you are. So I'm going to take you through a pruning process. <laughs> My mom and dad have a neighbor right on the back, in their backyard, right across from the wall. And, uh, and I've never seen the neighbor or anything, but they have these, these wonderful trees that grow up on the side of the wall and, and, and come over into our property. And there are a plethora of birds that live in those trees. I mean, so many different kinds of birds. We just sit there and we look at, of course, it's not that my dad doesn't entice them with bird seed. He's out there feeding all the time. But we have all these birds. I mean, we've got six doves. We've got finches. We've got scrub jays. We've got, we got so many birds. And, and, and it's like we're looking them up online. Well, what's this one? This is a new one. It's just a, uh, just a, so many different kinds and they live in these trees and so we enjoy you know sitting there as we're we're taking care of our mom and and we're sitting looking out the window and 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 looking at all the birds and looking them up in the book and just enjoying the beauty of nature well I was in that room the other day and and all of a sudden I heard all this buzzing I had to close the window because there's all this buzzing and everything that was going on and all of a sudden I'm looking and there's a man with a ladder getting ready to climb up on the ladder and, and attack that tree that's just right outside my mom's window. I was like, oh, man, he's going to prune that thing, you know. And he saw me looking, and so then he put the ladder away, and I thought, hmm, does he not want us to know what he's doing or whatever? And all of a sudden, there was a knock on our front door. Oh, just letting you know, I'm going to be crawling on the wall. We're gonna, I do this annually or every so many years, you know, prune these trees. And we're like, oh, okay. I mean, he butchered those trees. I mean, I'm sitting there. He took all the beauty away from those trees. All the leaves, there's one tree that the hum hummingbirds love, and they have the little flowers and everything. They come in. All the flowers are gone. All the green is gone. Just this big, massive tangle of wood, brown, you know. And I just sat there watching that day, and I became so disappointed because it took away the beauty that we were enjoying. And the birds were just a squawking. They were all in distress. I mean, I mean, suddenly their nests in the tree were exposed Oh boy, we could preach on that one, couldn't we, a little while? Their nests in the trees were exposed. Suddenly they're just on guard because now, now the predator birds were coming in. 
you know. And I was just watching all of this stuff that happened, and it's just like those birds were in distress, and I was in distress. I was so upset. I was like, he ruined it. You know, it's just all this. And, and T.D. Jakes was talking about that this morning in, in a video that he'd put out. And he said that when he was a little kid, his mom had all these rose bushes in the backyard. And she would go out there and she'd prune the rose bushes. And one day while she was gone, he decided to help her. He was about eight years old. And he decided to help her. So he took the, the pruning shears and he went out there and he said, I nearly killed those roses. He goes, I was just cutting, 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 and I knew clear. And when my mom came home, she was just so furious at him. And, and he's like, what? I just did what you did. And she goes, no, you didn't. I know where to cut. I know where to cut. You don't, but I know where to cut. And he drew the analogy that, that in the pruning season, that God knows exactly where to cut. And, and as distressed as I was, literally for a couple of weeks, you know what? It didn't take long, Mom and Joyce, that pretty soon those leaves, I was surprised at how fast those leaves and those red flowers came back. And now there is a, a fullness and a beauty. It's not all over the place. You know, there's a fullness and a beauty. God knows what he's doing. And so when he, when he comes into our life and he starts cutting things and he starts bringing it about, know this, that whatever he's doing, he's doing it to bring about a fuller, you know, a more beautiful, full of fruitfulness in our lives. Last week we talked about, and, and Willie uh, mentioned it again on Thursday night, you know, out of Jeremiah 17, that we will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Go listen to Thursday night's word, a powerful word, you know, Planted by the and it says even in the time of drought we will be green, even in the time of drought, even in the time of of difficulty when the sun burns hot we will be green, we will be fruitful in every aspect of our life. So so trust the Lord, trust the Lord even when it looks like He doesn't know what He's doing, even when it seems like everything is out of whack. Like what what is going on? He knows exactly what He's doing because He's bringing us about. To greater fruitfulness. Why? Because God is refining a wine in the body of Christ in this last day. And there will be a pouring out of wine. But let me tell you what, I've learned a lot about winemaking when we named the church the wine press and we studied some things in the Word of God about the wine press. I, I did a lot of research and I tell you there was one there was one wine company that said we will serve no wine before it's time. Because there comes a time in the process and the preparation of fine wine that there's a waiting period. There's a waiting period. In every wine, and, and the different kinds of wine require different kinds of waiting periods, different ways, different... I, I, I was just fascinated uh, in one video. I wish I could find it again. But I was fascinated to, you know, uh, that literally champagne is where champagne came from. And because of the way that the, the, the weather is, you know, it'll start to ferment and then the cold will set in and it'll stop it. But when it starts back up, it brings about the bubbliness. And so it's the process that makes each wine so unique. And it's the process, and, and the process is different for each one, you know. The process is different. You know, I, I've, I've perfected, I think I've done pretty well perfecting uh, uh, baby back ribs for my family. And my family loves baby back ribs. They're like, no restaurant can be like this. And so one day I decided, my dad loved beef ribs, so I decided I was going to make him beef ribs. And I used the same process. Fail. So big a fail, my dad couldn't eat them. It was such the fail. Because the process isn't the same. And this is what I want. I really was wanting to get back into 1 Peter chapter 5, and it talks about shepherds, and it talks about elders in that particular passage of, 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 of Scripture. And, and as I was pondering that, you've got to understand this, that not every pastor is going to be the same because not every calling for every church is the same. And if we don't understand our calling, then we don't understand the process that God is carrying us through. And if we try to say, hey, you know, Pastor Bloom up the street, and now it's a, another gentleman, his name escapes me right now. The process for him is going to be very different than the process for this church, you know. And so God, you've, you've got to understand that God chooses and he brings you to the place that fits for the calling. 
And the calling of the process isn't going to be the same, but the process is imperative. And if we understand that, then we begin to say, okay. But when we judge all pastors or we judge all churches or we judge at the same and say, well, it's not like this, well, there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. There's a process for it. And so it's important to know and understand all these things, to realize that if God's brought you to a church, if he's brought you to a pastor or a pastor to a church, and and they're not like everybody else, that's pretty good, you know, because there's a reason for that. And he builds the church. He brings in, I really truly believe that, he builds the church and he's bringing people together because the calling and the purpose is going in the same direction, amen? And so, so, so all of that is not in my notes, but all of that is to say this, that, that we trust the Lord. We trust the Lord. And when we get worked up or when we get tempted to, to be upset or offended or when we get tempted to move outside of out, what I would say outside of his will, it's because it comes from a place where we stop trusting the Lord. Because things change. And there's a transition. Say transition. You know what? Transition can be hard. Transition can be confusing. Transition can be restless. Transition can be so many things. But in that place of transition, God's about ready to do something different than the way he's been doing it. And we can get lost in that place of transition. I'm going to read scripture out of 1 Kings chapter 17. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. And as I've been meditating on uh, Psalms 37... Uh, trust in the Lord, do good, dwell in the land, and feed on his faithfulness. Amen. I tell you what, I'm going to feed on his faithfulness because nothing else is secure. Nothing else is sure. I've learned that even with insurance. Nothing is secure. Nothing is sure. It can be just turned around, jerked out up from underneath you in a moment flat because there's nothing stable outside of God. There's nothing stable. Even if something is stable for a period of time, just a transition or a change or a crisis can cause something that's stable to become unstable. And so who are we going to depend on? How are we going to trust? Well, uh, the best bet is to trust in the Lord, amen, because there is no shadow of turning in him, and he knows time from beginning to end. Nothing shakes him. Nothing surprises him. He's already knowing. Amen? And so he has a plan for each one of us and so we can feed on his faithfulness because God's not about ready to let his children down. So in 1 Kings, as I was meditating on this, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, the story of Elijah. And I'm going to begin reading with verse 1. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, king, king of Israel, and Elijah was a prophet, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand... There shall not be dew or rain these years except at my word. You know, I'm going to stop there right there and say, wow, what a proclamation. And what a, what a putting of our, uh, uh, literally putting himself in a place to be persecuted. Because he said, this is the word of the Lord. As the Lord God lives, uh, God of Israel lives, before, before who I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years except at my word. In other words, can you imagine the place that that would have put him in? Can you imagine the place of power that would put him in? A place of, 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 of being able to be manipulated or persecuted? Because it's like, you know, until Elijah says something, there's not going to be any rain or dew. Until Elijah says something, there's going to be a drought. That comes on the line. And tell Elijah, okay, Elijah, you better say something. <laughs> you better give you a word. And I can imagine all the pressure. And so God did something. He says, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. I believe God gave him that word to protect him. You know, because, because to give a word like he did to the king that says, look, until I say so, there's not going to be any rain, there's not going to be any dew, and there's going to be a drought come up on the land, no food, people are going to become desperate. And then God said to him, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it shall be, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. the Jordan and the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook think talk about feeding on his faithfulness 
You know, he was obedient to the word of God. He gave a hard word. He was not moved by the pressure or the, the, the influence or the power that that word gave to him or put upon him. He heard the word of the Lord. God said, now I'm going to take you away from all of this because it's going to get real bad and everybody's going to be targeting you because until you give the word, there's not going to be any rain or dew. And so he said, I'm going to take you to this place. And in this place, it's going to be an isolated place. But in that isolated place, I'm going to take care of you. Talk about feeding on his faithfulness. What impossible situation do we meet up with right now? Even in the midst of drought in California, we still have food on our tables. You know, and so so we, we can be we haven't been in that kind of just absolute arid kind of dust bowl situation that destroys just entire regions. Uh, I haven't experienced that in my lifetime. We've experienced it in America, but not in my lifetime. And so he's in this place where there's going to be a devastation through drought. God takes him to an isolated place, but God feeds him in that in that place. Talk about feeding on his faithfulness. The ravens, which is really amazing. Because they're predator birds, they're going to eat up everything they get a hold of. And so it's supernatural provision. It's a supernatural act of God, feeding on God's faithfulness. That even the bird that he uses to bring him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening is going against his nature. Think about it. That's how powerful God is, church. What are you facing that seems undaunting? What are you facing that seems scary? What are you facing that seems, do you not know God? Or is it that we need to grow in our knowledge of God? He says this in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says to the children of Israel, and you've heard me talk about this before. He brought them out of bondage in Egypt. He brought them literally to the border of Canaan land. And they could not enter in because they did not believe. You know? They said, oh, before God says, go in. I'm going to drive out the inhabitants before you. I'm going to give you this land that I promised to your fathers. And they said, you know, Joshua and Caleb were like, let's go. Let's possess. They, they had faith in their God. But the other ten said, um, let's just check it out a little bit. Let, let's, just, let's go spy out the land. Let's go check out. You know, right there was unbelief. Joshua and Caleb just said, God said it. I believe it. Let's go do it. But the other ten said, um, let's go see. Let's go check it out. The minute we have to do that, it reveals and manifests our unbelief. It reveals and manifests our unbelief that says, I don't know. We have to go see. God said this, but what do I perceive in my natural senses? Can it be done? But you forget that God's a miracle working God. God can change the nature of the raven not to eat the food and to bring it and give it to Elijah. Do you not know that God could change the very nature of nature itself to provide for you because you are his child? Do you not know that keeping power in 1 Peter chapter 1 that I, I say over and over, didn't this morning, but I say over and over and over, that God's keeping power, that he has the ability to keep you in any circumstance? No matter what we go through, do we trust in the Lord? Because if we really trust in him, we will not, just like the ten spies that said, ah, you know what, I don't think we can do this. We went into the land and we found out that, yes, it is flowing with milk and honey. It is a good land. The grapes are just huge. A man's head, so to say, you know, it's huge. The grapes, it's just beautiful. There's not, but there's giants in the land. But they forgot that God said, he was going to drive out the inhabitants before them. They forgot that God, who miraculously defeated Pharaoh, the greatest nation, the greatest uh, dictator on the face of the earth, God brought him down to size and delivered them out of bondage. You don't think he can take care of the giants? And so the pressure of that, gee, God didn't say go check it out so that you can be afraid in the natural mind. He just said, go and possess it. I'm going to go before you. Do we realize that God goes before us? Do we go realize that God is making a way? There are some people in our church right now that there's been a transition in your livelihood. There's been a transition in your livelihood. There's been a transition. You're moving into something that you haven't been there before. 
Some people have retired, and, and so there's a transition in, in finances, and yet you don't think that God has already made a way for you? You don't think he's already providing for you? You know, some of you have had a transition in your family. Some, some of our beloved uh, loved ones have gone home, and there's been a transition, and now we're facing uncertain times. We're facing a time that we've never walked through before, and yet God is still there. I'm in a whole new season of my life right now, a season I have never been in before, a season that I, I have never experienced before. But God is there, so we can trust in the Lord. We continue to live according to our faith and to do good, and then we will feed on his faithfulness. I talk dwelling in the land, to dwell, and, and, and in John chapter 15, about abiding in the Lord, abiding in him. You see, it's when we neglect the things of the Lord, it's ne when we neglect our prayer life, and when we neglect the word, that we begin to doubt. But when we stay strong in the word, when we stay strong in the word, when we read the word, it brings comfort, it brings confidence and assurance that God's the same God, the same God that fed Elijah, with his faithfulness, denied the nature of the bird itself to feed him is the same God that is taking care of you. And he's the same God that will continue to take care of you. I shared with you last week that I was thinking about this, you know, as I age and I have no children or grandchildren and, and no spouse. And as I age, I think, well, what happens if I come to the point and, and, and I can look at that and I can say, this is scary, Who's going to help take care of me? But do you know that God's got me? He reminds me every time I read 1 Peter chapter 1 that he is keeping me and he's got me and I don't have to understand, I just have to trust. I'm so amazed how many times Becky will tell you this, that so many times over the years, I believe in tithing, and, and God is faithful to his word, and I'm not going to get into it right here, but if you want to talk to me about tithing, whether it's New Testament or Old Testament, I'll sit down with you and talk about it, but I know there's a blessing on the tithe. I really do. There's a blessing on that. But so many times, she takes care of my finances. She's always, you know, I, I used to travel, and she would take care, pay my bills, and do all that stuff. And so she's always taking care of my finances. And she will call me up, and she'll say, hey, this is your income this week because I, I have a flexible income. It's only a percentage of, of what comes in. And she says, this is, you know, this is your percentage. And so many times throughout the year, she says, you can do one of two things. You can give your tithe or you can make your house payment. Numerous times. Becky has happened numerous times where she said, you can give your tithe or you can make your house payment. And each time I say, why are you asking me? <laughs> she goes, because it's your choice. And I said, of course we're giving my tithe because my first fruit belongs to the Lord. And then everything else is blessed beyond that. Becky, not one time, not one time in 23 years has my house payment ever been late. There's been times when we thought, what are we going to do? I've hung up the phone and said, okay, God, we're going to be faithful. I don't know how you're going to do this. But every single time, whether it's been an unexpected card in the mail whether it's been, you know, where sometimes, and Becky sometimes will say, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at the counting and I can't tell you how this happened. You know, why? Because God is a keeping God. He's a faithful God. When we trust him, and in that moment, that was trust. In that moment, I said, God, I'm going to trust you. And when we trust you, he is always provided. Just like David, I can say this. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, and I've never seen his seed out begging for bread. I have watched amazing miracles come in the mail. I have watched people open uh, a letter or open mail that just literally left them dumbfounded. Because God, yes, Adelyn, because God has made provision where we didn't even see it coming where we didn't even know that God was making provision. And so this is the trust. We trust in him. And when we trust in him, we're not, we're not seduced into doing something we shouldn't do to try to make something happen. Think about it. Think about it. You know, could you imagine if Elijah says, okay, at my word, there'll be no rain or dew, where, where people could have literally said, I'll give you whatever you want. Make it rain. I'll give, you, I'll give you up to, you know, there was one, one king that says, I, you know, said, I'll give you up to so much part of my kingdom, you know. 
I'll do this or I'll do that. The influence of that would put a person in power. You know what? The character of a man is, is literally derived by that. I don't know how many times, in fact, there's movies made on it, but I, I don't know how many times a person has started out in politics to represent the people because he really cared about their community, he or she, and then ended up in Washington and everything changes. You know, why? Because of the influence of power and money, those things can destroy, can literally corrupt in no time at all, you know? And so, so you look at that and you see, okay, Elijah, I'm going to bring you over here. I'm going to get you out of the way, and I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to feed you. In fact, I'm going to send the ravens every morning and every evening. They're going to give you bread. They're going to give you meat. You're going to drink from the, from the brook, and I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to sustain you during this drought. But then listen, to, look in verse 7, and it says, And it happened after a while. Say after a while. <laughs> it happened after a while. In other words, for quite some time the ravens came and the brook flowed. For quite some time, he was sustained on the supernatural provision that God had given them. But there came a time when that changed. And it says, and it happened in verse 7, after a while, that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And it said, and it goes on to say, the brook dried up, you know, the raven stopped. <laughs> And suddenly the provision that was there was so supernatural began to change. You know, when a brook dries up, it doesn't dry up overnight. A flow begins to lessen and lessen and lessen till it becomes a trickle. Have you ever watched a, 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 a brook dry up? And then, then it gets down to a trickle. Then it gets down to puddles. And there's a provision in the puddle. And the puddles begin to dry up until literally the earth cracks. And there's nothing left, mud, and then there's just dry, cracked earth. What happens in the process of the brook drying up? Where does our mind go to in the process of the brook drying up? Right here is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we go back, that, where we go back to the verse that says, trust in the Lord. Because the same raven, Lena, the same God who sent the ravens continuously every morning and every evening, the same God that su sustained the brook during drought to provide drink for the prophet is the same God in the process of the drying up. He's the same God that's faithful. He's the same God that's going to keep. He's the same God that's going to prove himself miraculous. The same God that changed the nature of the bird to provide food. The same God that sustained the brook in a drought to provide water in the drying up because there's going to be a transition. And in times of transition, oftentimes there's a drying up. Have you ever faced that? I've been through transitions in my life. I've been through transitions. I've been times where, where, you know, there was fruitfulness, there was fullness, and then all of a sudden things begin to happen. And you know what? It's that time of transition that is the most proving of the genuineness of our faith. Because how do we remain when we see everything drying up? How do we remain when, when jobs change or when, when we're not receiving the income that we used to receive or, or we're not knowing the fluidity of, of the situation that we're in and, and things are happening? Do we still trust God? I think that this is a proving right now that is really powerful. Do we trust God? The same God that changes the na nature of the bird, the same God that brings provision supernaturally is still the same God even when it looks like everything's drying up. And don't forget what Jeremiah 17 says, that if we are rooted and grounded in the river, you know, by the river, the tree planted by the river, with its deep roots going deep, that even when the brook begins to dry up, the roots are so deep, it still taps into the source. And when we tap into the source, then we know that God is faithful, even when I don't know where it's coming from. We've had quite a, a financial change in our church just because of the, 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 the pruning and the, and the seasons like that. But God is still immensely faithful. 
He is still immensely faithful. The bills are getting paid. God is being faithful. Why? Because we trust. And we have an altar. You know, because when you can be generous, even in a time when things are going down, that's when you know that you trust God. Because you're willing to give, because you're not conserving fearful for the future, you're willing to be generous because you know the law of God. You know the law of the kingdom is that generosity begins generosity. Amen? That you can't outgive God. I've heard this my whole life. You can't get outgive God. You cast your bread upon the water, it's going to come back to you. All right? And God will be continuously faithful even when it seems like things are drying up. Think about that. Even when it seems like things are drying up. And so, so it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. You know what I see right now is that so many times there's been such a drying up. I can look at ministries. I can look at uh, uh, careers. I can look at not just, not just on a local level but on a national level. And I can see that there's been a drying up in a number of ways. Emotional drying up. Relational drying up. All kinds of things that are drying up. And, and where are we in the midst of that where do we keep our faith or do we give up and just say I want to give up you know there was things with insurance that dried up over the last two weeks that just about just about frustrated me to no end and and you know do we just say I'm going to give up and like I always used to say and do what and go where (laughs) giving up doesn't get you anywhere no I'm going to press my faith into God you know, and I, I, I've said that God will take care of us. God will provide. God will speak. In fact, there was one, there was one situation where the doctor said, no, we're not going to take you. And we set to prayer and we just said, God, I trust you. You're going to make something happen. And then there was a turnaround and they decided to do it. All right. But our faith, we didn't just sit there and say, well, I'm going to give up. Now, my natural self wanted to do that. My natural self just wanted to go out of my mind. But then I sat there and said, God, you are faithful. You are faithful to us. You are faithful to our family. You know what we have need of. And God, I just, I'm going to trust you. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm going to trust you. And then comes the turnaround. Because the testing of our faith, remember 1 Peter 1, the testing of our faith proves the genuineness of our faith. So are you going through a testing of your faith? Pass the test. Pass the test. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't, Don't resort to human ways. You know? Don't, don't resort to the ways of the world. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Resort to the ways of the kingdom, the ways of the king. Be like Jesus. Be imitators of Christ, amen, and watch him be faithful. You know, the enemy loves these times of transition because it's in that time when you're watching the brook dry up day by day. You're watching things dry up. You're watching relationships dry up, and the enemy comes in that moment and says, look, God's left you alone. Look, he's failed you. Look, he's, 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 he's forgotten all about you. Uh, you know, what, why, what are you trusting him for? Because look, obviously, his provision is drying up. But when God's provision in one way drives us, it's because he's got another plan. He's got another purpose. And if we give in to the enemy, you know what happens in this time? Instead of waiting on the Lord... And trusting him and being faithful in that, we start trying to figure out our own way. Well, maybe I made a mistake. (laughs) I only say that because I've asked myself that. You know, I remember telling Alto one time, I'm either really, really a great woman of faith or I'm the biggest loser in the world. (laughs) You know who I am, Wanda? I'm a woman of faith. I'm a woman of faith because I had a word from the Lord. And when you have a word from the Lord, you trust that word. But you know, there's going to be testing time when you sit there and say, did I really hear God? Did I really? Okay, I really stepped out. I did this and this and this. <laughs> and it's like, and okay, everybody thinks I'm crazy. You know, or, but I had a word from the Lord. You know, I don't know who said it first because great men and women have, have quoted it. But somebody at one point in a moment like this coined the phrase, never doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. Never doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. When you got that word from God and the unction was upon it, the anointing was upon it, and you knew that you knew that you knew that it was God's word, 
And now suddenly you're sitting in a place and God's provision was on it for a while and now it seems to be drying up and, well, the enemy comes in with doubt and says, well, maybe you didn't really hear God. Maybe it was just your passion. Maybe, don't doubt the word of the Lord when it came. God gave Elijah the word of the Lord. You know, and God sustained him for a period of time in a certain way. Now there was a transition because God was getting ready to do something, a new thing, and he was going to provide in a new way. And not only that, but God was going to provide for Elijah, but God was also going to provide for a widow and her son. And the blessing was going to go beyond Elijah. Now it was going to spread out. The supernatural miracle of provision was going to spread out. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to preach on this, but let me, let me just go ahead and, and read it. Verse 8 of, of 1 Kings chapter 17. Then, then, only after the brook dried up. <laughs> God's timing, God's strategies. I don't get him sometimes, but I know this. He's always sitting there saying, do you believe me? Do you trust me? You see, God didn't give him the next word until the brook dried up. And it says, and then, verse 7, and it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And it says, and then, then, and only then did the word come, the Lord come to him. Did he get the new direction? I remember uh, uh, talking to Lita one night on a Thursday night, and, and I thank God for her influence in our life. I really do. But I was talking to her, and I, I began to get frustrated because I had seen the brook dry up, and I was seeing things happening, and I knew the word of the Lord. And she looked at me and said, Polly, when God gives you a word, you stick with it until he gives you the next word. And until he gives you the next word, you don't move. You don't move. God will give you the next word. But until he gives you the next word, you stay exactly where God had put you, all right? So the brook was drying up, and I started to say this a minute ago. In that minute of transition, I'm watching this all over our nation right now. When the, the, the brook's drying up, and people are getting restless, and people are saying, you know what, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here and do this. I can be more successful over there. I can be over here. It's greener on the other side. Because we get uncomfortable watching the drying up of the brook, but God still has a plan. But if he has not given you a definite word, don't go on somebody else's word. Don't go on somebody else's opinion. Don't go on somebody else's counsel. Hear the word of the Lord. The same God who gave you the clear word of direction in the first place will give you the next clear word of direction. And until you receive that clear word of direction, I'd say stand still and wait on the Lord. Why? Because he is honing our ability to hear him. He's honing our ability to hear him because God's Plan, and plan for us right now. Going into this next season, what I believe we're going to see the greatest outpouring, we better know the voice of the Lord. He says this in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. You know, in the last two and a half years, I have never seen a time of confusion with information. Literally, you can't trust the news anymore because the news will give you conflicting information. You can't, un, you can't trust the, the, the Internet anymore because the Internet will give you confusing information. You can't trust Google. You know what? You can't trust Snopes. You can't, you can't trust the fact checkers. <laughs> and I don't care what side you're on. You can't trust the fact checkers. There has never been a time where I have seen where suddenly it's like, how do I find out the truth? Where do I go to to find out the truth? I can't Google it. I can't Snopes it. I can't fact check it. I can't turn to the news because everything is skewed and everybody is saying one thing and then another completely opposite directions. Is there ever a place? You're going to have to know the voice of the Lord. If there's ever a time to dwell in the land, to abide in him, and to know his Holy Spirit, we're going to have to trust in the Lord. That Holy Spirit that gives us the wisdom, that bears witness of the Father, amen, will lead and guide and direct us for the steps of a righteous man are ordered, a good man are ordered of the Lord, and he delights in his way. And even if he messes up and even if he makes a mistake, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. How great is that? 
How great is that, that even if I do mess up, I'm still sustained by the Lord God Almighty. Amen? Because he's merciful. He's merciful. His grace is sufficient, amen, for you and I. So to trust the Lord. But it's in this place that in the quietness by the brook, in the isolation, in the separation, in the, in the times that, that we can't be busy doing everything. Right now I'm not busy doing everything that I was doing at one time because I'm doing something else. And that something else is my God-ordained time for the season. But it gives me time to sit and read. It gives me time to sit and, and ponder and to listen and understand and to know his voice more than I've ever known it before. That's the perfection of what God's doing in our life. That's the number one thing that we need to be doing right now is to come to know his voice like never before. So when we have a clear word, the enemy can't sidetrack us with doubt, can't sidetrack us with unbelief, but that we literally hear the word of God and we trust him in spite of what we see and we trust him in spite of the drying up we trust him in spite of the trial because our roots are deep. Roots are going down deep, Becky. Roots are going down deep. Michelle, the roots are going down deep. I'm realizing that there's a greater strength in me than I've ever known before, and it's coming through him. Amen? And so we trust him in every aspect of our life and of our heart. And to know that we know that we know that God will take care of us. I don't know what the future holds for me. I told you that last week. I don't know what the future holds for me, but I know who holds my future. And I know the faithfulness of my God. Therefore, I don't have to worry and I don't have to stress. Matthew 6 says, trust in the Lord. Trust in him. You know, he takes care of the lilies of the field. He takes care of the sparrows. How much more? He paid a dear price for us. Amen? And that dear price, he's going to provide for each one of us. I love the scripture in Isaiah. Deuteronomy, just a, just a reminder, he was telling the children of Israel in Deuteronomy, um, I believe it's, I put here 13, but it's 8, verses 3 and 4. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him. That is actually 13. Deuteronomy 13, 3 and 4. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. Obey his voice. Why? Because you know his voice. You obey his voice because you know. And in obedience, in obedience, in the act of obedience, we know the, the thing. You know, the other day, I'm going to say, I'm just going to say this. Willie gave us a, a, an exercise last Tuesday. And something that we've been doing together and, and feeding. And, and, and he just said, you know, I heard the Lord. And the Lord said, we're not going to do this tonight. And all my natural reasoning wanted to go in a, in a certain direction. Well, but naturally, this doesn't make sense. But here's the reality. We're in danger if we try to know what God is saying to us by reasoning with our natural reasoning. Because God defies natural when he, when he causes the raven to bring food that the raven would normally devour, that's defying the natural. And so you can't trust God and think naturally. And if that was nothing more than a test, Willie, if it was nothing more than a test that said, are you going to hear the word of the Lord and are we going to abide by it and obey it even if it doesn't make sense naturally? And when I walked away from this whole thing, first of all, it was the testing of whether or not I believe the word of God in your life. And secondly, it's whether or not I trust that God is doing, giving a word, even if it defies natural reasoning, are we going to obey? And this is where a lot of people get hooked up or, or get little, literally get lost in, in their spirit walk is because they're letting the natural say, I don't know. That's what happened with the ten spies as opposed to Joshua and Caleb. When God said, go in and possess, and they're like, no, 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 these guys are way bigger than us. They're going to defeat us. No, but they're not bigger than God. God is way bigger than them. Where is your faith and your confidence in a bigger God or is it in yourself? Because if it's, And it tells us in that passage of Scripture because he says we are in their eyes as grasshoppers. No, you are in your own eye as grasshopper and you have made God nothing more than a grasshopper because you don't have faith to trust him. That
He is the great God Almighty. He is faithful. He is powerful. There is nothing too hard for him. God will do. He will perform his word. He will make it come to pass, Lena, no matter what, because he is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. And he does that. He does that. Because what, what, what is general will put anybody on the battlefield that has not been tested. And so he tests us to see if we will remain faithful, to see if we will remain in kingdom ways and not in the ways of this world, to know his voice, to obey him, that we shall serve him and hold fast to him, not cut and run. You know, when COVID happened and people couldn't, people couldn't do what they normally did and worship, you, people cut and run like crazy. Were you watching? People were cutting, churches were folding things. Why? Because, well, I can't do what I was always doing. You have to know that you're called. You have to know if you're preaching to nobody. You got to know. You got to know. Becky tells the, the testimony of a, a gentleman that God had spoke to and said, go into the certain city and I want you to preach. I want you, I'm going to give you a, a harvest there. And he went and he rented, where, rented this building and he went and he advertised and nobody came, but he still preached and he still sang. And Sunday after Sunday, he preached and he sang and nobody came. In fact, nobody ever came, but he continued to preach and to sing. But years later down the road, when God finally released him from that, years later down the road, he met a woman and said, and he was telling the, his testimony of, of being faithful even when there was nobody there to see it and being faithful. And all of a sudden, she just looked at him and said, I mean, her parents, right? Her parents went to the same place, to the same building, and when they walked in, they said it was as if it had been prepared, and God brought a big harvest, a fruitful harvest in that building because of the faithfulness of one man who preached when nobody was there. And so when COVID came and we were preaching to the camera and we had no idea who was on the other side of that camera, I'm telling you, church, God is still working a harvest. Do you believe? But when that happened, how many worship teams couldn't be on the platform to worship so they left their position and their post? How many pastors closed up their churches and left because they didn't like the situation? But when you have a word from God, you'll be faithful no matter what you see, what you know what you understand and for those who remain for those who remain you see God doesn't need our gifting I heard somebody say this a number of years ago I can't believe it was Michael Murdoch I can't remember but he said this I was in a conference and I was feeling pretty low about my skill and my gifting I'd had some accusations come against me and I was feeling pretty low but he sat there and says, you know why you're where you're at? Not because of your skill or your gifting or your education or your qualifications. He goes, you are where you're at because you are faithful. You are faithful. You see, God can give skill to anybody. And God can qualify anybody. There was a lady in our church, my grandma's church, when I was a little kid who didn't know how to play the piano but sat down and God gifted her to play the piano. I, I've heard again and again where God suddenly gifted somebody in a moment, instantly gifted somebody to do something. You see, God doesn't need our gift. He doesn't need our education. He doesn't need our skill. He needs our faithfulness. He needs to know that when the rough, the tough, the tough get going, when the going gets tough, he needs to know that when things are going on and it's uncomfortable, you're still going to stay. He needs to know that you're going you're to remain. Fruit that remains. And if we do, then we'll see God use us. And that's what T.D. Jakes is saying. Don't get, don't, don't get, don't, don't get off the path. You know, because it's not about the grape. We're the wine press around here. Oh, Lord, if we'd have only known when you told us to name this church that. And all my friends thought I was crazy. Why would you name your church that? Have you ever heard of the grapes of wrath? I said, you know what? The wine press is more than the grapes of wrath. Read the word of God. Wine is beautiful. Wine is beautiful. It's the joy and the delight of the Father. The wine, he poured in the oil and the wine. The wine is healing. The wine, is, the wine is restoring. 
The wine is, is tremendous in the word of God. Don't take one scripture and read it as that. But if I'd have known the wine press is the crushing. <laughs> if I'd have known, I might have been tempted. You know, but when you see the beauty of the crushing, to produce that which is processed to produce the wine. Oh God, let the wine flow from the wine press. Let the wine flow. And Lord, not a cheap wine. Not a cheap wine because it didn't take any time to process. Not a cheap wine because it, it didn't wait. It didn't remain. But a wine that stood and stayed in the process and was tempered. Father, the wine that is pure. The wine that is costly. The first wine that the Lord made, Lena, at, at the first miracle at the wedding. You know, after people had well drunk the wine. And Jesus turned the water into wine. He turned it into fine wine. The finest wine that the master's ceremonies had ever tasted. He had to stop the whole celebration and said, look at these people. They do this. They serve you the fine wine first so then after you're well drunk, you don't care you're drinking cheap wine. But these guys saved the finest wine for last. Oh, God is producing a wine for the last, Lena, a wine at this last call, at this last revival, ushering in the coming of his son. The wine is going to be the finest wine. But church, it's taken time in the waiting. In the waiting, he's processing us. I don't want to be cheap wine. There's something I've been after for a long time. You've heard me. You've been here for very long. The scripture says, and some reaped 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. And I look at that scripture and I say, some 30, some 60, some 100. And you know this. You know, I've said this time and again. Why settle for 30 when there's a 100-fold? Why settle for a little bit when you can have the whole thing? Why settle for, for doing a little bit for the kingdom when there's the fullness, the fullness of God. But I did not know this, Jimmy. I did not know that waiting for a hundredfold takes a longer process. It's not something you just get out and do to be doing it. And then you only reap a small harvest. But it's something that you wait on. And you wait for God to say, now it's time. Now I'll release it. But the fine wine is that which has been shelved for quite a long time but then the value in it and the the flavor is unlike anything else we'll serve no wine before it's time god continue to do the work in us continue to let us hear your voice continue to let us hear your voice be gracious to us father be gracious to us isaiah 30 18 says therefore the lord will wait the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice and blessed are all those who wait on him. Wait. We'll wait till I hear the clear word, Becky. We'll wait till he says walk this way. Isaiah 30, 21 says, Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it. I hear a voice say, walk this way. You've never walked here before. Amen? God will give you a clear word. Psalms 37, 23, I said it a minute ago. The steps of good men are ordered by the Lord. They're ordered. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. Hear his voice. If you're not hearing anything, keep dwelling, keep sitting, keep abiding, keep trusting, keep leaning into, keep, keep digging down deeper until you hear him tell you the next step so you hear him because he's merciful and he's gracious and like David in Psalms 37 verses 25 through 26 I've been young and now I'm old yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread he is ever merciful our God is ever merciful and Lee and lends and his descendants are blessed. It says in Psalms 27, David makes the proclamation 13 and 14. I would have lost heart. 
when I saw the brook drying up. <laughs> I would have lost heart when all my friends thought, you lost it. I would have lost heart when they made accusation against me. I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. In the land of the living, not just in the sweet by and by. <laughs> not one day over on the other side, but right here. That we will see the goodness of the Lord. So wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. It takes good courage to wait when the brook's drying up. It takes good courage when you see everything, oh, this is going to get bad real quick. It takes good courage to stay in that place and wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he will strengthen your heart. God is so good. God is so good. I'll have a little conversation with my mama and say, Mama, I don't know. And then the, she'll eat her breakfast and it'll like, shall I read from Strings in the Desert? And then it's like the minute I see the verse that she's going to expound, I'm like, oh, she's going to preach at me. You know, <laughs> she's going to preach at me. Okay. All right. This is our proclamation of faith. This is the courage. We're going to let the word of God bring courage to us. It's going to be my proclamation of faith. I'm going to turn it around, my conversation. I'm going to turn it around. And he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Don't serve wine while it's cheap. No 30-fold. The fullness of time. The fullness of time brings the fullest harvest and the finest wine, the finest wine. Father, I'm so grateful for your word tonight, today. I'm so grateful for you, the encouragement of your word. And Lord, we lay into it just like that tree in the time of drought. Our roots go deep, finding the depth, the depth, where everything on top looks like it's all drying up. But there's a depth in you. There's always, there's always a pool that we can tap into. And then our leaves will always be green, even in the time of drought. And when the heat camp comes, we will not be anxious because we know that you are keeping us. You are our source. And so far, Father, we pray for our hearts right now, Lord, if there's any place that we've been struggling. Lord, even now, the word has revealed that to our hearts, the place where we've struggled. So, Father, that's not condemnation. When that word reveals it, it's just saying, let me take you deeper to secure your mind and your heart. I'm going to bring you some things to prove to you. He says this in Deuteronomy 8. He says, I let you wander in the wilderness and I let you experience hunger to prove to you that I will feed you. To show you day after day after day after day that I will provide for you, that I will sustain you. Because I am faithful. I am faithful to my word. And I am faithful to my children. You know, when you pray a great price for something, you don't leave it out in the backyard, do you? When you pay a great price for something, you find something special to keep it in. God's keeping power. He paid the greatest, greatest price for you and I, the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And you think he's not going to take care of you? He's not going to take care of you? He's not going to provide for you? So, Father, we thank you for your keeping power. We thank you that you didn't just save us to watch us be destroyed, but each day you're proving yourself greater and greater to each one of us. So we renew our faith right now. Just say it with you. I renew my faith in you, God, right now. Forgive me for my wayward thinking. Forgive me for doubt. Think, forgive you, me for not trusting you. I really didn't look at it that way, Father, but I realize now that my, my anxiousness about the future, my anxiousness about my present, Father, is just causing me to not believe in you. So, Lord, we just turn it around. We trust you. And we believe you. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just in rest upon his promise. Just to know the saith the... Oh, let's sing that one again. Tis so sweet. To trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest 
upon his promise just to know thus saith the oh, I'm going to sing that one again tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know thus saith the lord jesus jesus how i trust you how i proved you o'er and o'er jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace to trust you more jesus jesus how i trust you how i proved you or and or jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace to trust you more oh for grace to trust you more oh for grace to trust you more so father here we are the situations we find ourselves in, the uncertainty about tomorrow, the uncertainty about the future, but God, you are certain. You already know, Father. You're already going ahead of us, and you're preparing the way for us. So, Father, in this moment where we've been anxious or we've been fearful, Father, where we've been just troubled in our mind and in our spirit about certain things, we release it right now. We just shake it off. And, Father, we make this declaration that we trust you. And, God, that you will give us the grace to increase our trust, that day by day, week by week, year by year, Father, we are increasing our trust in you, for you give us all that we have need of. And we declare it in the precious name of Jesus. Sing this with me with, 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 with determination. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you, how I proved you o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust you more. Oh, for grace to trust you more. I bless you, my wine press family, and I know that God is proving himself to you. He will continue to prove himself to you, for he is faithful. He never forsakes us, amen. And we will see the supernatural provision take place. Ravens, if need be, he'll act, literally change nature to bring about provision because he is our God and he is faithful, amen. God bless you. You and just wait for the word of the Lord and know it will come. He will not delay. He will prove himself. Amen. God bless you.